anybody can have a look at a student blog. Yeah. And I think a lot of academics have difficulty with that because they're used to dealing with stuff that's just between them and the student. Um, you know, think, well, maybe that's people will judge the institution on the standard of the blogs. Um, the other difficulty I have actually is, or the challenge really, is assessing student blogs because I'm using them to assess people's ability to critique and to evaluate their work. Not, I mean, I do evaluate their blogs as well in terms of um, the content and the layout, you know, how attractive they are and how they might attract traffic and so on. But I also, one of the main aspects of it is the fact that they're meant to be reflecting on their practical work in their blogs. And then that leads up to the contextual review that they do alongside their MA project. But it's also because every, every journalist should have a blog, ideally, or something like that. They need to be out there, you know. What do they get from it then, do you think? What do they get from it? Oh, well, the point is they turn it into, um, they turn it into an e-portfolio. That's what happens, because what they're putting onto their blogs is all the practical work they're doing. And um, because um, I actually get them to use hosting, um, hosting software like Vimeo and Audioboo, you see, for their, Vimeo, for their videos and their, and their audios. So they're actually, as they go along, posting up examples of their work and showing how they're progressing. So when they go and they um, are, are trying to get either a work placement or work experience or, or applying for a job, what they can do is simply just go straight, you know, show, the, show their prospective employer straight to the blog. And there on the blog are examples of their work. Have you had any successes, notable successes? Oh yeah, I mean I had one about, um, I think it was three years ago, it was the very first really, and this was a student who'd done a blog and it had morphed into an e-portfolio and she went to Reuters to do some work experience. At the end they said, um, you did very well, will you send us a showreel of what you can do? And she said, no I need to send you a showreel, and just leant over and went click on the on, on the um, on the keyboard and was able to show them straight away what she'd done because it was all there on her blog. They were terribly impressed and gave her a job. Well, I, I originally started using blogging about three or four years ago when our students were doing group presentations and this was within the unit that dealt with media regulation and with media ethics. And as groups they had to make a presentation and the idea was that as groups they blogged about the process and they also blogged about the topic that they were given. And the idea was to get them used to the idea of blogging. And in the early days of blogging, people found it quite easy to be interactive and to be conversational. So the idea was that if they blogged as a group, they would actually have to talk to each other. And at that time, I made it compulsory that they put up so many posts and that they actually made so many comments on each other's group blogs. Time has moved on since then and I no longer use the group blogging process because I, it's very important for our journalism students to have their own blog. And there are various reasons why they need to have a blog. One is they simply need to get into the habit of blogging and to be making conversation online along with all the other things that I expect them to do like tweeting and so on. But um, for their individual blogs, virtually from day one, they have to set up a blog if they haven't got one already. And the idea is that they actually present themselves on this blog and they blog about the process and the experience of being a vocational journalism student here at University College Falmouth. Um, at the same time, they're expected to have a section within their blog where they upload um, their assessments, their practical assessments, because we're training our journalists to, um, to become proficient um, in radio, television and online and the idea is that they will be going to work somewhere in the broadcast industry either in radio, television or online or on three platforms all at once. So the idea is that they actually upload their assessments and at the same time 20% of the mark they get for every, every assessment point is the mark they get for their blog. And it's not simply having a blog, it's not simply being able to provide content for a blog, although that's very important. Um, 
50% of the mark will go on the blog content, on presentation, on style and on their ability to communicate and also to um, be interactive. But 50% of the blog is actually to do with reflection and the idea is that they reflect on their practical work, that they actually um, critique what they've done and they actually evaluate what they've done. And the idea is that they evaluate it by looking at professional examples of the same sort of thing and and look at what they would do if they had to do it again. What would they do that was better? How would they improve it? And how would they go about it next time? Now, of course, we have several assessment points throughout the year now under the Common Academic Framework. So the first assessment point after five weeks, I won't expect their reflective powers to be particularly high, but of course by the time they get to the end of the 30 weeks talk to element of the MA, I expect their reflection and their analysis and their evaluations to be much more sophisticated. So it's very much, um, very much um, a, a way of, of, of building on skills as they go along. Okay, um, for students who aren't journalism students, what sort of skills do you think they could get from blogging? Well, I guess it depends on, on the course they're doing, but I mean, certainly from, from blogging, people can learn how to communicate, I think. And it's, it's, it's really learning how to communicate with other people who might have similar interests to yours. It's learning how to be conversational in the way you go about things, rather than simply broadcasting or commenting in the kind of traditional kind of newspaper um, comment section kind of way, maybe. Um, it's also a way of becoming digitally dexterous, I would argue, because if you maintain a blog and you're up, updating it, you know, either once a day, several times a day, several times a week, it will help you become much more digitally dexterous and it will also help you get into the world of social media because, after all, a blog is part of social media. Um, tweeting or twittering is simply microblogging. So, um, it's really encouraging people to join the conversation, I would say, whether it's in something like English or sculpture or illustration or whatever subject they're studying. Okay, and in terms of employability, what does it give students from an employer's perspective? What does a student who has a, an interesting blog have that other students don't have? Well, it, first of all, it shows they can communicate. It shows they have something to say and what they have to say is interesting and that they're prepared to take on board any comments that people might have and prepared to maybe change their argument or change their approach um, according to those comments. But also, it's a terribly important, ju just a terribly important way of showing that you are up there and that you're at the sharp end of, of what's happening um, digitally and what's happening technologically because if you have a blog it just leads on to so many other things and so many other ways of communication so in many ways it demonstrates transferable skills and I think very important ones. And in terms of um, how you teach, um, teach it to students how to blog, are there any golden rules or things that you would in particular say to them that you should and shouldn't do when you're creating a blog? Well, there are plenty of golden rules. I mean, first of all, um, students, if they don't know how to already, need to know how to operate the content management system of a blog. So a little bit of time is needed at the beginning, helping people to get up and running, you might say. But my approach always is just start blogging. But one of the important things is, for instance, you need to turn things into bite-sized chunks. I mean, I always used to use this phrase, you need to chunk things all the time. And by chunking things, I mean that you, you stick to one topic per blog post. And if you start going off, um, if you start going off at a tangent, that's the time to stop and put it into another blog post. The other thing is to be nice and interactive or, or, or to provide um, opportunities for interactivity because what people don't want a blog to be is like a book or an essay or like an academic article say. It's not just a grey slab of text because you can communicate in so many ways on a blog, not by text. And so the important thing is to be able to, to use images for instance, to be able to hyperlink and to be able to put those links to embed them in the text so they look nice and tidy. And it's teaching things like that. It's also teaching people about copyright because when it comes to images, a lot of, um, a lot of stealing of copyright images goes on in the blogging world. And it's something that certainly our students who are going into journalism 
I must never ever do. Um, you need to be very careful of a photographer's copyright. But one of the most important things is the interactivity. And very often I will say to people, let the links do the work. You know, what's the point of saying what's somewhere else on the web if all you have to do is just link to it with a few chosen very sort of careful words explaining what it's about. You know, don't, don't waste time um, re, remaking the wheel in a sense. If, if somebody else has said it, simply link to what they've said rather than you trying to do it. So it's very much making it attractive, making people want to you know, bring traffic to the blog, making people think there'll be something interesting there, there'll be something original, there'll be something that they want to find out. And the important thing also is to make sure that you are linking all these things through your own Twitter feed, because if you have a blog, you should be on Twitter as well, and maybe also you'll be using Facebook in the same way and various other forms of social networking. Um, so if you've put some video on the blog, for instance, and you've used Vimeo to host it, which is what I always recommend, because that's what the professionals use, um, maybe put it up on YouTube as well. So you're, you know, you're, you could be found everywhere. And we also have to teach people, or I have to teach people, about search engine optimi optimization. Search engine optimization, or SEO, is really important, and it's really important you get certain keywords into the headline and into the first paragraph. Um, do you have any tips for motivating students who are either reluctant or, you know, frightened to do it? Or how do you motivate them to actually engage with the idea of a blog? I think that's a difficult one. I think, especially at undergraduate level, you will come across people who just don't yet have the self-confidence. And also, people need to have something to blog about. It's no good asking people to set up a blog, but not give them some idea of what they need to be blogging about, some sort of subject area, some sort of some sort of message that they need to be getting over. And I think um, motivation is a difficult one. With postgraduates, I simply say to them, if you want to get a job out of this at the end, you need to be out there in the blogosphere. Um, it's up to you how you do it. And I do find that some students get a really heavily engaged with the blogging exercise. They understand straight away how important it is. They find a way of doing something that's maybe a little bit different. Um, some of them, for instance, are quite good at the start at doing things like 10 top tips. You know, they find something that they can do and that makes them blog at least once a week. I think if you have a mechanism when you're setting up a blog as a student where you think, well, maybe I'll do a series and the deal is that I'll put something up every Monday within this series, it means that automatically they're updating their blog. But it's, it is difficult and I think... I mean, I have a blog, it's not mine, but I run it on behalf of a social enterprise, so I do blog myself, and I think that helps, because I can point people to the blog and say, this is where I felt I didn't do things quite right, and this is a good example where I got lots of traffic, and this is another example where people responded, and, and so on. But I think, I think motivation, it is difficult, because people are aware that a blog is live, and that everybody, not just their mum, or their aunt, or their boyfriend, is going to read it, potentially. And I think there's two important things that we as academics need to concentrate on at the beginning when we're introducing people to blogging. And one is um, copyright and the other one's defamation. Um, copyright in particular regarding photographs, because a lot of students tend to think that if you just put a link in explaining where the photograph has come from, the image has come from, or if you simply... Um, put in some sort of reference to who took the picture, that is enough. It's not. And people need to be very, very careful to find out what the rights are on that image. And most images are not rights free. There are very few around that are. Um, it used to be the case that you could use Flickr, for instance, to find right free images, but Flickr has actually tidied up its act and persuaded people who use Flickr to put to put rights, to put copyright onto, onto their images. So people need to be careful, need to check, and that needs to be covered at the beginning. Um, the other danger always with blogs is that because they're live, it's possible that um, people who are blogging can defame other people or organisations. And I think that's something that we as academics need to keep an eye on at the start, especially at undergraduate level, and also make sure that they understand what to defame someone means.